um, Reverend Elder Margarita Sanchez for a moment while I make sure that all systems are firing here. I think they are. Uh, so let's uh, let's see here. Uh, here, here, and here. Welcome. Welcome. Bienvenidas. Seja bem-vinda. É muita alegria que eu acho de estar aqui com vocês. Que eu tenho de estar aqui com vocês. Welcome. We are invited today to be transformed. We are welcome today to be with. Let me tell you something. I came from a long line of African heritage. In the Caribbean, in the Hispanic, and from Latin America. And in our context, we use to have long names to honor our lines of our mother and the lines of our fathers, to know, to honor our ancestors. So my complete name, even when you guys must of the time know me as Margarita Sanchez, my complete name is Carmen. Margarita Sanchez de Leon. Just recently, I decided to use my complete name to remember where I come from, to whom I belong and my heritage. Because understanding that is when really I could understand what in me needs to be transformed, to whom I will need to be with and how. So today you are invited to find the last name, the complete line of being transformed, of being with. And we are going to discover together. Hi, hi again. I thought that um, Reverend Elder Sanchez's words, or Reverend Elder Carmen Margarita Sanchez de Leon, I thought that her words were appropriate for tonight. That was a greeting that she gave at our general conference. And uh, you'll be hearing more of that and seeing more of our general conference in the weeks to come. I promise, I promise, I'm gonna get the information out soon so that you'll know when to join us for that. Um, I think it would be a really good idea to pray. Uh, so let's do that. God, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for the gift of each other. Thank you for all of our friends and loved ones gathering around the computer in order to um, just talk, think, meditate, share with each other about what our journey has been like. We ask that you would bless this time. We ask that you would bless all these connections. Oh gosh, I hope it all keeps working right. I think it is right now, but you've got your hand on it, God. So I'm gonna leave it up to you. In the name of Jesus Christ and all the holy names, amen. Thanks again for joining me tonight. Um, I really did want, I want to have some fun. It's after eight already. I want to have some fun with um, with uh, Nadia Boltz Weber. I had never heard of her. And I've got to tell you, she is really knocking my socks off. We had some, um, Keith shared some of her writings, some of her work in uh, in his sermon on Sunday. And I wanted to share a little bit more of that with 
you tonight. Um, first, though, let's remember Mary and Martha. There we are. Oh, good old Mary and Martha. I love them. Y'all might know I kind of took off on them a little bit on Sunday. I didn't get in too much trouble. You'll be glad to know. Uh, so let's uh, let's look at I share the screen. I am being kind of uh, spastic here tonight, but we got it going on. There we go. There we go. Uh, Luke 10, 38 to 42 from the message. As they continued their travel, Jesus entered a village. A woman named, by the name of Martha welcomed him and made him feel quite at home. She had a sister, Mary, who sat before the teacher, hanging on every word he said. But Martha was pulled away by all she had to do in the kitchen. Later, she stepped in, interrupting them. Teacher, don't you care that my sister has abandoned the kitchen to me? Tell her to lend me a hand. The teacher said, Martha, dear Martha, you're fussing far too much and getting yourself worked up over nothing. One thing only is essential and Mary has chosen it. It's the main course and it won't be taken from her. So if Jesus is the main course and we talked about Martha, do, Martha doing the work and, and Mary getting the learning after Poor old Martha was the one who invited Jesus in the first place. Um, it's quite an interesting conflict between the two, isn't it? Um, one is serving Jesus. The other is listening to Jesus. We get caught up in the middle of that more often than we'd like to think. Caught up in the, uh, the meditating, the learning, the thinking about how to do it and the doing it. You know, that I think maybe, maybe it's an American thing, I don't know, but it seems like we can get kind of stuck in that spot sometimes. How do we find our way out? How do we find out who we are? That's why I wanted you to listen to uh, Reverend Elder Margarita. Um, to talk a little bit about finding your true self, where you began and where you're going, who you are and your ability to transform, your opportunity to transform and your opportunity to um, take, on, take on a bigger name in the course of your transformation. Gosh, you know, that MCC, that, that general conference of ours, that really put me on a roll about transforming and getting transformed. I wish I could get a little better transformed on using this, uh, th this equipment. I call myself so fleet and good on this uh, technology and oops, <laughs> you know, the oops always comes along and catches you. Um, but I want to, um, gosh, obviously I'm a little bit discombobulated because we got started so late and uh, I need, I'm kind of changing plans on the fly here. Um, cause I do want to get to Nadia because she, like I said, she really fascinated me. Let's, um, let's look at one of her readings that we heard on Sunday. I think you've got it there. Sure you do, okay. Um, let me grab a little bit of water. Okay, Garrett Clint, if you're out there with me, give me a message, okay? Okay, um, okay so here she is. I looked harder at Matthew 25 and realized that if Jesus said, I was hungry and you fed me, then Christ's presence is not embodied in those who feed the hungry, as important as that work is. But Christ's presence is in the hungry being fed. 
Christ comes not in the form of those who visit the imprisoned, but in the imprisoned being cared in the imprisoned being cared for. Well, I'm going to come back to that sentence because you can get it turned around in your head, but she, here she comes explaining. To be clear, Christ does not come to us as the poor and as the poor and the hungry. Because as anyone for whom the poor are not an abstraction, but actual flesh and blood people knows that the poor and hungry and imprisoned are not a romantic special class of Christ-like people. Mm -hmm. And those who meet their needs are not a romantic special class of Christ-like people. We are all equally as sinful and saintly as the other. No Christ comes to us in the needs. No, Christ comes to us in the needs of the poor and hungry, the needs that are met by another so that the gleaming redemption of God might be known. No one gets to play Jesus. But we do get to experience Jesus in that holy place where we meet others' needs and have our own needs met. So what I wanted to talk about was how this is, um, what she's talking about is, to me, it's what the process theologians talk about, where Christ, here, when she says, this is the, the, the sentence, and I got it confused when I first read the sentence myself. Christ comes not in the form of those who, who visit the imprisoned, but in the imprisoned being cared for. I thought at first that that sentence meant in the imprisoned people, Christ is in the imprisoned people being cared for. But it's not in the, the people, it's in the being. Christ is in the being cared for, the process of caring, not in the carer or the care -y, but the caring that happens in between those two. That's what she's talking about. And that's what really sparked me. I thought, wow, what a concept. That is just like really cool. Because it, that's what really cuts into this notion of the, the carers or the care being some magical romantic people. You know, we, um, that's what we do. And I love her using the word romantic because we do romanticize it. We think, oh, you know, the, the saintly beggar on the corner who is going to smile beatifically when I hand them an orange instead of screaming in my face something that makes no sense. You know, as you know, as she said, the poor and the hungry and imprisoned you know, uh, what is she, how does she say it? Um, anyone for whom the poor are not an abstraction, anyone who can actually smell them, okay, knows that that's not romantic. And, you know, when, she, when we, I think about the, the romantic caregiver, I flashed on the book about um, Damien the leper that we had to read in high school. Very romantic or romanticized understanding of what this person took on to go into the leper colony and to be the, the minister and to eventually contract leprosy himself. Um, oh my, oh my, at 13, I just thought that that was so, um, well, it was inspiring, but it was this elevated kind of magical story. It wasn't about the actual wounds and the blisters and, and the suffering, real suffering, not just um, theater. Uh, I can stop share the screen, this screen I think now. Yeah. And that's what I just really thought was so, and think is so amazing about Nadia Boltz-Weber, 
um, she just cuts through it all and doesn't allow any room for um, romanticized, a romanticized gospel. She's really in the, the doing of it, the being of it, the, the hands-on, real life, what is this about? I want to share with you um, a piece from her. We'll get to see her for real. I'm going to make sure I've got this in the right place, for which I have to come over here. There we got it. Um, Keith is laughing at me. And I'm trying to teach us, Keith. Uh, for a couple minutes, though, I'm going to let Nadia Boltz Weaver teach us because I found a, a couple of really wonderful um, talks by her. This is an interview on, uh, from a podcast. And she's talking about grace. She talks about, I want to fill you in in case you, anybody that's uh, too young to remember, this hasn't been that long ago, but Lance Armstrong, who she talks about, uh, is a bicyclist who was the world champion cyclist and he was caught doping. It was a major scandal. And she, so I wanna make sure that you know that as I let you hear her. There we go, I've got the right thing now. Yeah, let's listen to her for a minute. The thing I've written about more than anything and spoken about more than anything in my career is the idea of grace. And um, grace is a really difficult thing for us because it means, it inherently means the ball's not in our court. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can't earn it. It's not something that you climb toward. It's something that you get. And on some level, we think it must, if it's free, it must be worthless. And so, um, I think that people, instead of focusing on grace, like to focus on being good. And But being good has never set me free in the way that um, truth has and things that have interrupted me from outside of me. So, Well, I think good or the pursuit of being good is the thing that provokes the feelings of less than and shame and 100%. guilt and, and insecurity, whereas mm -hmm. grace is permissive. Mm -hmm. Right. But okay. grace is also something that you describe as being a pain in the ass from time to time. Totally. Like it's inconvenient. For sure. Especially. So explain. When it's uh, when the reason grace is tricky is because um, I want to feel like I've made myself worthy of something. And if it's truly grace, it means it has nothing to do with worthiness. It just is. Mm. And that's hard. And then also grace sucks because if it's if it's true for me, it means it also is true for the people who've hurt me. Right. And that's, I don't that's like definitely that. Definitely inconvenient. <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> right. And um, right. like I'm all for it until we get to that. That's why um I always say that like with my luck, I'll be seated at the heavenly banquet between like Ann Coulter and some racist cop. Yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know like if you, you believe in grace, it's like right. super uncomfortable in that way because mm -hmm. because self-righteousness is just never an option. And I love self-righteousness like I love chocolate. And so it's intoxicating. It is. But self and purity plays right into that. 100%. Because if you can re if yeah. you really feel like you're more pure than your fellow person, yeah. that just you're right on your bully pulpit to be self-righteous. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, that's why it was that that moment was so interesting when I was interviewing Lance Armstrong. I had that conversation with Lance Armstrong yeah. on stage at Nantucket because that day it was so interesting when people knew I was the one. I, so I'm super, I'm, I'm like obsessed with the idea of compassion right now, but not like as a virtue to adopt, to be good. Fuck that. Nothing's ever worked like that for me. I'm not in, like, if someone's like, oh, did you read that, that really great book about compassion? I'd be like, yeah, not interested, uh -huh. but I'm so, cause I'm such a pragmatist. I'm super interested in the effect of compassion that I'm interested in mm -hmm. because when somebody has been in a true space of compassion right across from me, it's moved the needle 
for me in terms of considering something I hadn't considered on my own, seeing a way I might have been wrong. Like it's a safe and it's a loose place to consider those things. Whereas when someone's been accusatory or challenging or calling me out, I immediately get defensive. I can't hear it. Right. So I'm, I'm just obsessed with this idea of what's the effect of compassion on me or even on my body in conversations. And so this person I know who does uh, trauma work, they work with people in trauma. I was asking them, like, how do you, how in the world do you manage to not be completely depleted all the time taking in these stories? Mm-hmm. And she had this image I just can't get over, which is, she said, I imagine the heart of God, like, right behind my heart. So that whatever that person is saying I feel it genuinely because it comes through my heart, but it doesn't land there. It lands in the heart of God. So, and then anything that comes out of me towards them doesn't originate from my own resources and deplete me. It originates from the heart of God and just comes through me. Right. Right. That's a very, well, that's a very like <laughs> unique and specific way of uh, imagining healthy boundaries for yourself. Right. 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 Okay. So that day when people knew I was the one having a conversation with Lance. They um, they said, "Hey, uh, don't let him off easy." Like people would come up to me all day and be like, "Well, when it comes to Lance, everyone's going to have an opinion or some advice." Right. Okay. But like, why? <laughs> right. So like, I what was is the end game because we love to know who we're better than. Right. We're obsessed with it. So if somebody so obviously had a fall from grace, there's the scapegoating um, instinct in the human being is almost inescapable. This is why, like when Brian Williams, uh, you know, when his career had that huge bump because he didn't actually falsify a news account. He exaggerated a personal story, which, Mm -hmm. by the way, we all have done. And every single time we do it, it creates an icky feeling in us. And those icky feelings build up and we have to do something with them. So what do we do? We wait until someone like Brian Williams comes along and we just throw all of our icky shit that we don't want to tell anyone onto them. And then we have to kill them, right? It's this collective way of relieving the anxiety. And we think that's going to make us feel better. That's right. But actually it's like empty calories. It it completely is. I mean, self-righteousness, I always say, feels good for a minute, but only in a way that peeing your pants feels warm for a minute. You know, then you smell bad. It's cold. (laughs) You know what I mean? Okay. So I'm having this conversation with Lance and I, and I just, hold on, let me just say one thing. I, I don't want to interrupt you, but like, this was my first exposure to you. (laughs) <laughs> and everybody needs to know, like, you're all right. So Nadia's going to interview Lance, and it's in the round at this very cool event called the Nantucket Project. And you're opening this is blind to him. Yeah, okay, okay, you are. Okay, so I won't steal no, it. No, no, no. Okay, this is where I'm yeah. going. All right. So just so you know, they had asked me, Nadia, would you? So I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in compassion right now. I'm only really experimenting with it. I don't want anybody to be impressed. <laughs> like, uh-huh. I'm just... I'm dabbling in compassion. Okay. So, but I'm thinking about it a lot. And they said, would you have a conversation on stage with Lance Armstrong? And I said, yeah, I totally would. Right. Then they said, would you have a conversation on stage with Sean Spicer? And I said, no, fuck that guy. (laughs) Like, just to say Uh my, my ability to be open in compassion. Yeah. Fucking limited. Okay. So, I, I get to that day, everyone's like, give them a hard time. Blah, blah, blah. And I sit there and I have that image of compassion, of having God's heart behind mine and, and sort of being open to this human being across from me as a person with a unique story and that most of which none of us know, right? Most yeah. of us don't really know this human being's full story. And And I said to him, opening thing I said was, Lance, I see from my notes that you took drugs you weren't supposed to, and then you lied about it. And then I said, oh, my God, I did that shit so many times. It was so great. <laughs> and everyone How long laughed. did it take you to <laughs> figure that line out? It was just that day. I was like, really? how's this going to happen? And so it just broke the ice. Totally. And, and everybody, laughed. there was he like this, so cathars- there was a right. catharsis, not just with him, but the whole, the whole audience. Was and like then I looked around tension. and I don't know if you yeah. remember, I said, you raise your hand, audience. 
if you at any point in your life took drugs, you weren't supposed to and lied about it. And people are like, yeah, I did that shit. You know, <laughs> there is a- Well, I think that's quite a uh, way of saying, let you who is without sin cast the first stone. I'm just, I am so in love with her. She is just fabulous. And there's so many things in what she had to say. Um, That image of God's heart behind your heart and the the whole way that she starts talking about approaching people and their stories. You know, you don't know somebody else's story. Um, Oh God, oh, 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 that's the thing she said beforehand was, I love self-righteousness like chocolate. Oh my gosh, what a line that is. Sink your teeth into the, sink your teeth into that and let it melt in your mouth, okay? Martha, Martha's self-righteousness or the self-righteousness that we feel when we're the care we're the person going to heal the sick or feed the hungry or, or visit the person in prison. And, and that chocolatey self-righteousness just melts in your mouth, all right? But it's not you. It's the fact that the service is happening. It's not your service and it's not the person being served. It wasn't Nadia's attempt efforts at being compassionate or Lance Armstrong's receiving her compassion in that little story. It's the icebreaker that broke everybody open the icebreaker of her honesty and integrity. Admit, yeah, I I did that shit all the time. Um, To bring everybody to that same level. What's that, the name of, uh, one of her books is, is something about sinners and saints are all the same people. And we hate that. We hate that because Either we get so saintly that nobody can stand us or we get so trapped in our sinnerness that we just don't do anything. We become the ones that make ourselves unworthy, okay? Because like she was saying, it's not about, it's not about your worthiness. It's not about your scoring the points to get to heaven, to get more stars in your crown or whatever. The grace that happens is apart from you, even if you're the one channeling it. In that same way, don't you love that double heart image that she had about your heart and the heart of God? Because that's not just about well, clearly, you know, she was, the, the response to the, the question was about, don't you get depleted by giving out that service? Um, and so it's about that, but it's also about having that constant source of the, the compassion that gets injected into the situation doesn't have to be from you, you know? And it's not gonna work for you all the time. Sean Spicer was a bridge too far, okay? Um, and I, you know, I might have things to say about that, but that's another issue. What I really want to get into is her idea of having the heart of God behind your heart, being able to um, purify the situation. What she says in this conversation 
that they had before the place where I jumped into it for you was about uh, purity because this just, I think this is just like an, a really amazing thing that she did. Um, if you, do you remember, this has been, well, it's been a while ago. It was kind of past my time of being a, a nice young, a nice little Christian girl. And, you know, a little later, but the, this whole period where um, young girls were, had to have, get a, a purity ring and it was a whole, you know, a whole ceremony where, uh, the, you know, the, they would bring the young girl flowers and the, her father, hmm, her father would put on her finger this purity ring. And it was a promise to not do anything before marriage. And I mean, for some, it even included dating. I mean, I mean you didn't even get to like, talk to somebody and hold hands before you got married. How you were supposed to find somebody to marry is an, another issue. But this purity promise w became a really sexist and oppressive. And instead of, see all of those things that they did with us that were supposed to elevate sex and put it on a higher level, it made it dirtier, you know? Think about it. It made it dirtier, it made it worse, it made it something bad to stay away from. So what Nadia did was at one conference or on one blog thing that she was doing, she asked women to send in their purity rings. And they sent in their purity rings and she melted them down and presented it to Gloria Steinem as a, a, a statue of, uh, uh, or a, a, a gold vagina is what it was, um, as a symbol of the freeing and the liberation and the letting go of that shame and that lockdown, okay, that emotional and sexual lockdown and turning it into the beauty of sexuality. I just thought that was such a dynamite, dynamite thing to do. Um, so that, when she, okay, I took myself back to purity and now let's go back ahead again. Um, the, the effect of compassion being the thing that she's looking at rather than compassion itself. What an interesting thing that was. Hi, Brian. I'm glad to have you watching with us. Um, <laughs> oh, it's a little all discombobulated tonight, but I hope you can get something out of it. Um, the effect of the compassion that she showed Lance Armstrong in that moment was a grace that came over the whole room because everybody had to realize that they were, you, you're both sides of the coin all the time. You're the saint and the sinner all the time. You know, claim your power. And that's why I wanted to play Elder Margarita for you claiming her power, claiming her identity, claiming all the things that had come before her to make her who she is and claiming the power and the right to take that into the future as, as sword and shield, okay, as, um, as those things you bring with you on this journey to, to be and become, no, not to become the caregiver and the, the impetus, but to, be, to play your role in the process. There you go. To play your role in the process 
of grace unfolding. And to, to be able to hold that space of being who you are, being the, the person with the, the, you know, the, the online uh, ministry and the person who can't get things to work, <laughs> all right? But in the working of it, in the working out of it, that's where God's glory exists. Okay, um, coming back to this, you don't get to play Jesus. No one gets to play Jesus, but we do get to experience Jesus in that holy place where we meet others' needs and have our own needs met. Not, we participate in the doing. and have to accept that it's not our, it, this is hard, okay? I never quite thought of this as being in conflict. We are empowered, okay? Greater things that, than Jesus did. We are empowered and yet, in that empowerment, it is not our agency that brings it across the finish line. It's the God heart behind our part, our heart, okay? It's the grace, it's the process of the needs being met, the process of the process of the unfolding of the interaction. That's, that's the spark. That's the nugget. That's the kernel of grace that, that pops when you turn on the heat. Garrett, I don't know if you're able to speak or not. Um, or if you have anything to say, I see you sitting there. I'm watching um, comments here. I just know that Keith is laughing me at me and Brian Navarro is watching. Uh, <laughs> do you have anything to, to say to add or to? Sure, I, uh, especially the, the part about the, um, not being self-righteous like you're not doing it because you're you're thinking you're jesus or trying to be jesus um but it's on the interaction and you know uh, most of the ministries that i've done whether it's you know brown bag or laundry love or hospice care it's been about that interaction and the truth is most times, or it's very common for me to kind of get a little knotted stomach, especially the hospice, but to get a knot in my stomach. And then when I'm there, it's actually just the pleasure of the interaction. And when I've had the biggest issues have been like some, M some, some MBA students from USC came and you know, they were deeply offended when I tried to explain to them that people don't go and volunteer so that they can feel like they're at work again, or they don't show up and they'll, they'll get what they, they'll get their needs met, but they're not really having a good time of it if they're one of the clients there. And a big part of it was about having the pleasure of, of being there, of just interacting with people. And trying to maintain that is, is very hard, but that's what sustains the ministry. That's what brings people to come in and wanna stay is because they're getting their fulfillment. And by, as a volunteer, for instance, they're getting their, their fulfillment met. 
by their interaction with the people. N not by them saying, I'm so, such a great, look at me, I'm such a great person doing this, but by experiencing that, yes. that connection. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, 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 I think, a big key that one of the reasons why we used to make the lunches at Brown Bag in the church and later in the courtyard was to have people from the congregation be more a participant in the ministry and not just an observer or distributing cash. Yeah, yeah, the, the checkbook ministry. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, of course, that, Keith would Keith would really appreciate the checkbook part right now, but yeah, wouldn't we all? <laughs> um, but and it's uh, that's another area where you shift shift the focus from the check and the cash it represents to the experience of giving. I was interested in what you were saying about volunteers and um, people not wanting to volunteer to feel like they're at work again. Um, how do you pull that off? Because I mean, it is, work in the sense that um, there are duties involved. There are, you know, how you go into hospice and what you are assigned right. to do and not do. How do you make it not like work when there are, you know, boundaries and responsibilities, I guess? Well, you know, each one has their own set. Um, the, like, laundry love was really about having the preparation done so that people didn't have to do anything other than just put quarters in the machine. And if there was an issue, I kind of just was the, was the one who tended to absorb it, particularly as time went on. Um, you know, so it was, it was, it was me as a leader allowing people that are volunteering to, um, to have that experience without having to, to feel like they were marching too much. So that it, it and you know, it, it was, it actually worked out quite well with Brown Bag. Um, one of the things that, that we had to do was set certain safety boundaries because one time we even left and left the, uh, uh, we had extra people and one of the women who was regular said, oh, I'm just going to stay and watch the car. And she was in the car locked up shaking because somebody had tried to rape her while we were gone a matter of five minutes, but a group of people pulled them off of her. But that assault absolutely terrified her. So after that, we couldn't even have somebody stay by themselves. So you have to be aware of what makes it safe. With hospice, that was that was just the, probably the, just the most emotionally draining, and that was the hardest part on that one was just being aware when somebody was getting as a volunteer getting burnout, and you know you you missed it a lot of the times. It was that was really, as you well know, that was a very hard, stressful time. Very hard. Very hard. And again, I want to bring up that image that Nadia brought up with the two hearts, God's heart behind your heart, so that you're not, the, the stuff is not coming from you. You are channeling it. Um, because that's really what it is anyway. And when we get tied up in that notion of it's coming from me, that's when mm -hmm. the burnout really sets in. And that's, oh, not, yeah. that's not so much that you're doing something wrong, but you just, 
you're just kind of working on the wrong um, channel. You're 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 trying to be the agent. You're you're trying to be the Jesus instead of letting the Jesus happen. Yeah. You just trying to facilitate it. But yeah, and, and 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 sometimes we we I, I'm saying people. I'm thinking of one instance where someone was burnt out. I didn't recognize it. And I wanted her to do something and she couldn't, she found it difficult to tell me. And so the next thing I knew is I had someone just uh, sitting, just a pool of tears on the floor because she just couldn't bring herself to say, I'm, I'm, this is too much for me. And and this is when the caregiver needs care, and we have to yeah. recognize those things. We that's a that's a, a big church thing, isn't mm -hmm. it? That happens. We expect the pastor, the deacon, the whoever to always have it. And and the people who are working with it, we do it too. We make that assumption. And you know, especially if someone's been going at it for a while, we just kind of, oh, well, they can just, you know, Autopilot. stiff, up, stiff upper, upper, upper chin, you know, stiff upper lip. And it doesn't work that way. No, it doesn't. And there's, and that's not a shame thing. No. That's just, uh, you know, I mean, in any other kind of team, sport shall we say you recognize when somebody oh well so and so is on the disabled list you know we rally around we make replacements we just we accept it and then and allow them to the nurturing until they can come back mm -hmm. recognizing once again that it's not them and, and i and i think the other thing that that particularly when, when you get multiple ministries going, somebody may pop in and try something for a couple of weeks and we need to make it okay for them to do that. Yes. And to be able to say, you know what? I, I, I'm, I'm gonna move on, it's fine. You know what? That happens all the time. Or even and, just- Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, even just, I think sometimes we scare people off because they think something is a lifetime commitment. Yes. And we don't make it more like, um, if you can, hey, you know, come on by, if you got time this week and it's the only week you ever have time, come on down. Yeah. You know, or, make it- Or if you, if you just want to check it out, come down and check it out. You come don't down, have to- check it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's okay. Oh, oh. I know something that I was going to ask you, Garrett, that I've been meaning to mm. ask you for a while, and it fits right into what we're talking about and is maybe a good place to kind of bring us to a wrap on this. Okay. When, when um, the food bank ran out of mm -hmm. food, would it have been a, thing, a good thing for us to, for the congregation to say, oh, well, we can all come and contribute a few cans of something? Okay, so with that one, and Keith kind of said said it a little bit uh, this Sunday too, but I had sent Keith a note too. The only issue with that is you actually have to be prepared ahead of time because you have to explain to people to to respect the expiration date because that's the first thing you do at a food bank is they when you come as a day volunteer they give you a giant trash bin and they put food on a conveyor belt and you're looking at the expiration date and dumping it because tomain poisoning is not a cure for hunger. And it's hard for people. We've been trained and trained to think, oh, you take whatever you can get. Beggars can't be choosers, you know? And even beyond anything else, it's, it's disrespectful but it's also a matter of we can't do it anyway. So we have to dump it. So you have to do that. 
and we have to be prepared because if we collected it on a Sunday, it's not being distributed until the following Saturday. Right. Whereas when we get food delivered, we're getting it delivered Friday and Friday. it's being delivered Saturday. So that involves some preparation and that would involve going through uh, a minimum of Keith, if not the board. And the board is the, the, the board who has jumped the gun once ended up with a big problem. Um, where we just had a lot of problems and so it, it's 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 an okay idea but you have to do the preparation ahead it can't be just a last minute thing is it something that needs to be done at this time i mean what is the food situation right now? i don't i don't think so actually uh when we looked um although it was basics there was some food uh, went on the week that was canceled. So I think we could probably, I think we've probably got enough backup. Um, we might be able to even open the next time if it, if it happens. I mean, it's going to be happening. It's just a matter of each time. We're just going to have to check each time to see how much we've got and what we're prepared to do and, and last time it was just like there was there was a quantity but it was only it, there was there was quantity but not variety it was only a couple of it was like three items or four right, items thousand cans of tomato soup or whatever right. right right so you know and and the other way it kind of works out it's just a real hodgepodge so people coming in to collect it's a different thing with a food pantry as opposed to like right. a, an old deacon's cart or something. Right, 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 right. You know, I, I mean, all that. I just, yeah, it, 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 it sounds like it should be simple. Just out of experience, I learned it's not nearly as simple as, as it should be. I can, I can get that it's not simple um it's manageable it's just not it's, uh, yeah i yeah uh, the, yeah i guess that's what my next question was it, it if it's not simple but it would be productive mm -hmm. and and, and the other thing is be, and it would because i feel so often like it's in a way it's kind of like war you know a few people get drafted and they go off to fight and the rest of us sit here um, and maybe, you know, tie a yellow wood ribbon around a tree or whatever, but I, there's a disconnect of just, you know, putting money in a basket once a month and, oh, that's our food pantry or that's our hope net or that, you know, rather mm -hmm. than be, having a bit more engagement. Yeah, that was the idea behind the, the breaking. If, if, if the congregation generally knew more about the, the hope net process and the situation with the food, then if there needed to be a call up like that, it wouldn't be as, you'd ha kind of have some of the groundwork already laid, I guess. Well, I guess if we were gonna do lay the groundwork, although we'd have to, to talk to, to, you know, the other people, particularly sure. Martin. Oh, sure, mm -hmm. absolutely. You know. But, uh, you know, one of the things we did when we first joined HopeNet was we actually did collect um, product rather than money. And when we did, you know, we had two or three select items each week that people would bring in. So it would be a quantity. So you, of, had, you got, when did you, are you saying like you said, this week it's going to be cream of mushroom soup or something bring your cream of mushroom soup. right exactly i see uh-huh so they would that that was the initial when we first the when we very first joined it you know 25 years ago and we did that for a few years um and you know that would be if, if you were going to build up a back stock that would probably be the way to go you know, but again, you know, how much do we want to build up a backstock? Is it really, you know, we want a backstock for a week, but, you know, 
we don't want to hunker down and be hoarding it. You know, we don't want to have, have it be raining outside and say, we're going to wait for a rainy day. We're dry inside here. I, I didn't want to turn this into a whole meeting no. about it, no. but I wanted to, I did want to mention it um, in terms of our um, collective agency. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we tap in these days to our collective agency and thereby allow more grace to happen? Yeah, and that and that once again, just like we were doing with the with when we first started making the sandwiches in the church lobby, that was that was the idea was and that was actually the discussion that Pat and I were having because um, I wasn't even involved in the ministry at that point. I ended up being taking over that part of it and then ended up with the whole thing later on. But um the the uh, the problem was that we didn't have we weren't ha producing enough sandwiches and we'd been getting we'd, we'd gotten spoiled we'd had a um insurance company and one of the workers had been a member of the church who had been involved and when he died they took on one year of of doing this and making it in his memory and then they would bring it and we would distribute it well, when their year came to an end and they said, you know, our time's come, you know, it, we suddenly dropped down and didn't have hardly anything. And that's when we started having the discussion, how do we involve the church, you know? And um, in that instance, we purchased the product and, and the church assembled it, you know? It's just, it, it's each one has to be approached. But yeah, I, I like the idea of, that was one of the best things we did was get the congregation involved in actually owning the ministry as opposed to saying, oh, I'm so glad that you're out there doing, doing that for it, me. Right, right, doing that for me, exactly, exactly. Um, you know, and, and, I, and when I first started, because, you know, it was the middle of the AIDS, AIDS epidemic so it was like i kind of I, I i understood when people didn't you know couldn't handle it you know but and i can understand people not being able to handle going downtown that's it's very it can be very traumatic but and then there are other ways there are other ways to involve yeah no, yeah compassion can suck yeah Okay, well, okay, again, I didn't want to make this a meeting. Nope. No. Nope. Um, I think examples, in your face examples are good. I'll just, I'll just put it there. And if uh, other folks tune in this week and, and check this out, again, I'm so sorry about so many of the screw ups at the beginning, but we did get in here and, and you did get, do look up, um, let me put her name just in case you didn't get it. I'm gonna put her name in the screen. There, it's in the chat and I'll put it in here too. Um, whoops, there we go. Um, I'm putting it in the, I'll put it in the Facebook chat as well so that y'all can look her up because I just think she's hotter than firecrackers. Um, and if we're gonna talk about people that we wanna eventually invite, I know we mentioned um, the author from last week as somebody we might like to invite to preach. If I was, if anybody put out a suggestion box, I definitely would have her name in it myself. <laughs> um, she, it, um, she's really cool. Look her up online. There's a number of uh, YouTube videos and, and other things and check out her books because I, I, she's, she's our kind of folk. Let's put it that way. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, Garrett, do you wanna pray us out? 
sure. I do all the talking. Why don't you pray us out? God, we just thank you. Thank you for letting the electronics finally work. And we thank you for the sharing and the ideas and the inspiration. And we just ask you to be with us during the week that's coming. And a special prayer for Beverly Winters, who's having an epidermal this week. And our prayers with everyone here. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here, Garrett. Thank you okay. to, to Daddy Keith mm -hmm. and thank you to Brian. Good to see you. Um, join us again next time. Uh, and uh, keep watching, keep your eyes on uh, Facebook and other announcements for stuff that's going to be coming up soon. Okay. Okay. Good night and God bless. Good night. You. Take care.